this is uh, my coffee's gonna fall. <laughs> well, open your Bibles, please, to Hosea chapter three. Hosea chapter three. We look at uh, the Middle East as Mark mentioned in his prayer and to see horrific atrocities committed against Jewish people. Uh, but that's not the final word. Our passage for today, among many other things, gives us God's final word for the Jewish people, which is a glorious and good word. Uh, if you're in the car on the way home and your mom asks you, what did you learn in Sunday school today? We rehearse this every week, right? Because my mom did this every week growing up. It's my experience is experience of some of you anyway and your mom asks you what you learn in Sunday school today you will tell her we learn that the love of God for his people and consequently the love that we ought to show by God's grace to other people the love of God for his people consequently the sort of love that we by God's grace with God's help should show in our own lives is a steadfast, forgiving, pursuing, Christ-paying love, okay? It is a steadfast, forgiving, pursuing, and Christ-paying love. Chapter three of Hosea is only five verses long. It's probably, though, the passage in the book of Hosea that most people know the best. And you'll see the reason why. So many people love this passage. Now, let's do a little bit of quick review. Hosea, the prophet, has been called by the Lord. The prophets generally spoke the word of the Lord. On some occasions, the Lord called them to act out his word. And this is one of those occasions. And the Lord calls Hosea in chapter one to marry a woman that the Lord describes a wife of whoredom, a wife who is going to be serially unfaithful to him. That woman's name is Gomer, was Gomer. We saw that Gomer bore Hosea a child but then the second and third children that she bore, the language of the passage indicates pretty clearly that she bore them from other men, not her husband. So she's already been unfaithful to Hosea at least twice, very seriously. And now, as chapter three opens, we see that after that unfaithfulness, she's gone, left Hosea, taken up with another man, not her husband, and apparently intends to live with him in an adulterous relationship for the foreseeable future. So she has been completely unfaithful to this marriage. And yet... What does the Lord call Hosea to do? That's what we see as chapter three opens. Hear the word of the Lord. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods, afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord 
and to his goodness in the latter days. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy and inspired word. Well, let's look at the first part of verse one and then verses two and three, which are the Lord's instructions to Hosea and then Hosea's obedience to those instructions. So Gomer, his wife, has left him and is living with another man in an adulterous relationship. And it says this other man loves her. If you are Hosea and Gomer is gone, what's your attitude? Probably. Exactly. Good riddance. Thank you, Lord, for relieving me of this unfaithful wife. That would probably be the natural attitude of most of us, wouldn't it? And I'm not entirely sure it would be 100% sinful. I have to think about that. But probably he thinks, thank you, Lord, for relieving me of this woman who's already been unfaithful to me and now is just taken up living with another man. Sort of like the Samaritan woman, right? That Jesus encountered in John chapter four. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Now, watch the language carefully. Okay, so Hosea and Gom Hosea's love for Gomer points to the love of God for his people. That's clear. That's the main point. But don't overlook that Hosea's love for Gomer is the love of a husband in a human marriage. Don't overlook, as I was almost about to, don't overlook the application of Hosea 3 to human marriage as well. Look at what the Lord says. Go again. And now there's some disagreement among Old Testament scholars where you place the again. But it seems like the English Standard Version has it in the right place to me. Go again. Again. She's committed adultery against you, Hosea, at least twice with the children born from other men. Now she's living with another man. So at least three times she's been seriously unfaithful to her husband. And yet the Lord says, go again. Forgive her, Hosea. Now let's be clear. In cases of adultery, Jesus seems to say in Matthew 19 that that is grounds for divorce by a Christian. But you don't have to. It's not required. And here, instead of exercising his right to divorce Gomer, the Lord calls Hosea, in this case, to forgive. I have good, well, I had good friends, Christian friends, members of the church where I was a pastor, good members of the church, faithful members of the church where I was a pastor. The wife is now dead. She died of cancer a few years ago, and I had the privilege of performing her funeral. Husband is still alive. And many years ago, got a phone call. Pastor Steve, can you come over to our house? When somebody asks you to come to their house, you know it's serious. Okay, I'll, I'll come as soon as I can. She's crying her eyes out. He's confessed that he committed adultery against her while on a business trip with the business associate. She's devastated. But over the weeks and the months to come, 
the Lord gave her, remarkably, the grace to forgive him. Now, unlike Gomer, he was genuinely repentant for his sin, and that played a big role in it. But the Lord gave her the grace to forgive him. And the marriage wasn't restored overnight. It took months and years, but the Lord restored that marriage. And it was a powerful, powerful testament. Again, that's not what God calls everybody to do. But he did call this wife to do it, and he called Hosea to do it. And when that is his call, it is a powerful testimony. And as we were preparing her funeral, that husband just spoke over and over and over again of how her forgiveness of his violation of their marriage, the Lord had used it to transform. And he was a transformed man. I mean, he was a, he was a Christian, but relatively marginal, but through this forgiveness, the Lord set his heart on fire for the Lord. He is a very different man today than he was because of that experience of her forgiveness. Again, the Lord doesn't, he always calls us to forgive, right? That's always calls us to forgive. Okay. Um, but he calls Hosea not just to forgive, but to go again, that word again, again, is a really important word in this passage. And then notice the next word. The Lord does not just say to Hosea, go again and put up with Gomer. I know it's going to be difficult, but just try your best to live with this difficult person. The Lord doesn't say that. What does he command Hosea to do? Love her. Go again. Love her. Again, Hosea. And don't just live in a relationship where you put up with her. Love her. Love her the way that a husband is supposed to love a wife. Even though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. And we'll get to the rest of verse one in just a little while. A writer, Christian writer named Marshall Siegel says this. If Hosea and Gomer teach us anything about marriage, it's that the love of God shines brightest through us when marriage is hardest. Can you bear to believe that? Happy, flourishing marriages may sing the gospel in big, bright, major chords. I hope that's my marriage. But the minor chords of difficult and devoted marriages are often all the more arresting. Their beauty is haunting for being so much harder to explain. Have you ever know, had Christian friends who, for whatever reason, struggled in marriage, but remained faithful to each other and with the Lord's help, sought to persevere in genuinely loving each other. Have you ever known a marriage like that? Maybe it's like the marriage of, uh, of which it was said, it's a good thing they married each other, otherwise four people would be miserable. <laughs> Maybe you've seen a Christian where they're just for whatever reason, incompatibility, maybe unfaithfulness, and yet they persevered in love and forgiveness, and that was a powerful testimony to the love of God because everybody would know they can't love each other naturally like that. Something supernatural has to be going on there. Now, notice here, there's not 
any hint that Gomer's repentant. And yet the Lord takes her back. I mean, the Lord, Hosea, the Lord commands Hosea to take her back anyway. So what does he do? Verses two and three. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver. Whatever the reason is, it's necessary for him to pay to ransom Gomer out of this adulterous relationship with this other man. 15 shekels of silver, Joseph's brother sold him for 20 shekels, seems to be about a, an average amount for a person. But he has to buy her, and he has to throw in a homer and lethic of barley as well. Uh, and then verse 3, he speaks to her. By the way, Gomer's not named in chapter 3, is she? Not exactly sure why. Not exactly sure why. But the, the inspired writer, it's probably Hosea, assumes we know whom he's talking about. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine. So he gives three conditions. Now, it's, it's really, un, he's taking her back unconditionally. But he says, now that you're living with me again, three things are going to be true of our relationship. Okay, number one, you must dwell as mine for many days. You're going to live as my wife into the indefinite future. Number two, you, uh, you shall not play the whore. This pattern of adultery will stop. No more going outside of this marriage or belong to another man. And so nothing like what you've just come out of, what I've just bought you out of, a relationship with another man, not your husband. Okay? And then we read these words, so will I also be to you. So will I also be to you? Okay. What exactly does that mean? Well, that's a good translation uh, the English, unfortunately, is less clear than the Hebrew is. The Hebrew indicates that for a period of time, they will live together as husband and wife, but uh, Hosea will not have sexual relations with Gomer. Okay, Just as she's not to have sexual relations with any other man, he's not going to have sexual relations with her. Doesn't say for how long just into the indefinite future. Why not? Because his refraining from doing so is going to point prophetically toward events in the history of the nation of Israel. Right? That's the reason why. But don't miss the fact that Hosea's love is the kind of love God wants to see in our marriages. It's a persevering love. It's a forgiving love. It's a pursuing love. It's a love that loves again, even when we're done wrong. Again, God doesn't call everybody in Hosea's circumstances against whom the spouse has committed adultery to stay in the marriage, but he did call Hosea to do it. And he called my friend to do it. When he does, and the person really receives the grace of God to love that person who sins so horribly against them. Uh, it is a powerful testimony to the love and grace of God. And that's what the, the passage is about. It's mainly about, it's, it's not first about the love of Hosea for Gomer. It's about first about what that love points to which is the love of God. So let's look at the second half of verse one and then verses four through five. And here's the question. Right? The question will be, what is God trying to tell us about the nature of his love? And that's the question I'm gonna ask you when I'm done reading these. What is God trying to communicate to us, the reader, about the nature of his 
love, let's be specific, for us, his people, okay? What is God seeking to communicate about the nature of his love for us, his people? We'll say things like, God's love for his people is a blank love, okay? But let's read the passage first. Second half of um, verse one. So God instructs Hosea to take Gomer back, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other God and love cakes of raisins. Now, maybe you love raisin cakes. What's the problem with raisin cakes? Well, apparently they're associated with pagan worship. And uh, that's the love of raisin cakes because it's uh, uh, the passage associates it with worshiping other gods, okay? And notice the word there, turn, the verb turn, okay? They turn to other gods. And so uh, Hosea does buy Gomer back. He explains to her how she's going to live with him, but her living with him that way points to the future of Israel. And this is what the Lord says, verse four. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince. So Hosea will withhold sexual relations from Gomer, that blessing for a period of time. The Lord in the something of the same way will withhold the blessing of temple and prince and king from Israel for a period of time. Without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Okay, so let's look back up uh, at verse 1b first. I, and this is my question. Look at the words again. So God calls Hosea to go and love a woman who has been habitually unfaithful to their marriage, has been an adulteress on at least three separate occasions. And yet the Lord says, take her back, Hosea, and love her, love her, even as you take her back. So forgive her and love her. And that's meant, that action by Hosea is meant to point to the nature of God's love even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. So Hosea's love for Gomer in forgiving her and taking her back and loving her again is a picture of God's love for Israel, his Old Testament people, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin. Now, before you answer my question, we need to remember in the background here is the, the Old Testament theme. It's in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, here again in Hosea. Passages are cited in your handout this morning. That God is the spiritual husband and Israel, his Old Testament people, is his spiritual wife. And that image, of course, gets carried over to the New Testament, Christ is the bridegroom for the New Testament people of God who are the church, okay? So that image runs throughout scripture. So God's love for us, his people, is something like, something like the love that a husband ought to show to his wife, even when that wife has been unfaithful. Now, we should hasten to say it's also the love that the wife should show to the husband. Right, let's make that clear. Um, but the focus here is on that image of God as the husband of Israel. So what does verse 1b say about the love of God? Hosea's love for Gomer points to the deeper love of God for his people. That's his Old Testament people. That's his New Testament people. This is the love that if by God's grace you are hanging on today to Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, then the love for his people that God speaks about here is the same love 
that he has for you. So what are its characteristics? The love of God for his people is a blank love. What do we see from this? Okay. Rosetta? Okay. All right. It's, it, it's actually unconditional and conditional at the same time, right? That's... Ooh, that gets a little complicated. It's unconditional in the sense that Hosea takes her back. But once he takes her back, there are conditions, right? You have to live this way. Right? But it's it's underneath the underneath the idea is it's unconditional. It's not, is it based on, hey, so does the Lord say, um, Hosea, take Gomer back because, yeah, she's... You know, she's committed these terrible things. But golly, underneath, she's really a wonderful person. Is that what the Lord says? Do you get the impression Gomer's a wonderful person? I don't. Did God make you his child because you're a wonderful person? We, you know, we, we need to remember... In this passage, who are you? You're Gomer. I mean, we're supposed to be Hosea, right? Okay. But we're also Gomer. We've loved the cakes of raisin. We've loved the other gods. And yet God has drawn us to himself. And said, I want you to live with me as my spiritual brother. Because God made a covenant. Uh... Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So it's a it's an unconditional love. It's a covenant love. Okay. It's a covenant love. What is so marriage? We saw this in last week or two weeks ago in the term Malachi 2. Marriage is a covenant. What does it mean that marriage is a covenant? It means it comes with promises. Covenants come with promises. Last Sunday, I performed um, in. Pastors are finding we do more weddings now on Fridays and Sundays because places are half the, for receptions are half the cost on Friday and Sunday as opposed to Saturday. It's really remarkable. Um, so I did a, a wedding of two of my former students who I am thrilled to say really walk with the Lord. And I, I told both sets of parents, I said, the Lord has these two pointed in the right direction so far as marriage is concerned. But as they stood in front of me, and you know, one of the real joys uh, that pastors get is when you perform a wedding ceremony, there are times when only you can see the face of the bride and groom. And there was a, a time when she smiled at him in one of those ways that just is so full, was so full of her love for him that it just, it thrilled my heart that moment. But in that ceremony, I tell couples, I say, you can use a ceremony other than my ceremony, my standard ceremony that I do, but it has to have certain elements in it that are not negotiable. And so there's a promise. I promise to keep myself only unto you so long as we both shall live. For better and for worse. So this is Hosea, right? <laughs> for better and for worse. Lord, I got the worse. In sickness and in health. Uh, to love and to cherish till death do us part. 
for richer, for poorer. I forgot that one. Right? That's the that's the covenant. That's the promise that we give in marriage. Okay. So God's covenant with us, his people, is full of promises. And we've said before, what's the promise that's underneath all the other promises of the so the, the covenant that God is in within with, with us, his people, in theology, which is caught the umbrella term is the covenant of grace. God has saved us by his grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So it is a covenant of grace. God initiated the covenant by his grace. In Genesis 15, when God initiated the covenant with Abraham, and in the ceremony of that day, you would cut animals in half, and you would walk through the animals cut in half. Remember this from Genesis 15? And the symbolism was, if I fail to keep my promises under this covenant, may I be cut in half like these animals? That was the symbolism. Who walked through the animals? God did. Who didn't? Abraham didn't. Have you noticed that? The covenant that God has with his people is a covenant of grace. What is the guarantee that the covenant, uh, that you will remain in a covenant relationship until you reach glory. What's the guarantee that you will remain in a covenant relationship with God until you are in heaven? Holy Spirit is the guarantee, is the down payment. Yes, Rosetta. God's going to keep the covenant. God's going to fulfill the covenant. That doesn't mean we don't have our role, but God is going to fulfill it and bring us safely home to the very end. So the passage shows that God's love for his people is an unconditional love. It's a covenantal love. What else is it? Good, good. It's a unifying love. Let's put it that way. Because in, in New Testament terms, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. Okay, so there's a spiritual unity between um, God and his people, just as the two become one flesh in the marriage. Mm -hmm. There's a unity. There's an intimacy in that God means for us to be spiritually close to him. What else? So it's a, it's a unifying love. It's a covenant love. It's an unconditional love. Mm -hmm. That's so that's why I use the term price paying. Notice that Hosea pays a price to redeem Gomer. Huh? Out of this adulterous relationship, out of this situation, he pays a price. Because of God's love for us, what has he done? He paid a price. To do what? To save us out of our lostness. To save us out of our spiritual adultery. God paid the price. He paid the price of his only son. Given on the cross for our sakes. Taking our sins upon himself. Suffering God's just judgment against our sins. God paid a price. Hosea paid a price to take Gomer back. God paid a price to take us, to ransom us, to redeem us out of slavery to sin and make us his own. Okay, so it's a price paying, redeeming. It's a redeeming love, a price paying love. What else is it? Uh-huh, Willie? Forgiving. Okay, that one's really clear. It's a forgiving love. If the Lord came to me, I thank the Lord I'm not in anything even approaching the situation of Hosea. But if I were in that situation and the Lord came to me, 
said, God, you have got to be kidding. Take her back? After all that she's done to me? The pain? Forgive her? Are you kidding? And yet that's exactly what the Lord, he says, love her. That means forgive her sins against you. Don't overlook them, but forgive them. Forgive them. Let them go. Don't hold them against her. Now, what does God do in his love to our sins in Jesus Christ? He blots them out. He blots out our transgressions. Isaiah 43, 25. Psalm 103, verse 12. What? He separates our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. I asked one of my students this week, how far is the east from the west? <laughs> Answer, how far is far? So uh, it is a forgiving love. What else is it? Good. We didn't say pursuing, but we need to say pursuing. It's a pursuing love. Who takes the initiative here? Yeah, God does. Hosea does. Because God tells it. You take the initiative. Again, it's not as if Gomer has any inclination to go back to her husband. God takes the initiative. Why are you a Christian? Because I trusted in Jesus alone for my salvation. True. But what's underneath your trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? God chose you. God pursued you. Jesus says in John 6, no one comes to me unless what? The Father draws. And Gomer would have never come back to Hosea unless Hosea had drawn. And we would never come to Christ unless God drew us. to set God's love is a pursuing love. I mentioned the very first week we, we started to talk about Hosea, a book by a friend of mine named Ray Ortland called, and somebody uh, in the class, I can't remember who has told me, they tried to order it on Amazon and they changed the name of it. Okay, yeah, yeah, they've changed the name of it. But the original name was Whoredom, God's Unfaithful Wife in Biblical Theology. And listen to what, uh, Ray writes on this point about God's love as a pursuing love. He writes, pastorally, the biblical story lifts up before us a vision of God as our lover. Now, we've got to be careful with that image, but if we can discern it wisely, we can, we can, it's really balm to our souls, isn't it? God is our lover. The, God, the gospel is not an imperialistic human philosophy making overrated universal claims. The gospel sounds the voice of our spiritual husband who has proven his love for us and who calls for our undivided love in return. You see, Hosea could say to Gomer, Gomer, I've pursued you. I've paid the price to buy you back as mine, despite your horrific sin against me. And now I want you to live as my wife, to return the love that I have for you. And God says to you and me, I have pursued you. I have won you as my own. By my grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Now, I want you to receive my grace to respond to me in love in the way that a wife responsively loves 
in response, a wife loves in response to the initiating law. Her husband, God's love is an initiating love. Ours is a responsive law. We love because he what? First loved us. First John 4. Ray continues. The gospel reveals as we look out into the universe, ultimate reality is not cold, dark, blank space. Ultimate reality is romance. Now, again, be careful with the image, but listen to what he says. There is a God above with love in his eyes for us. An infinite joy to offer us. And he has set himself upon winning our hearts for himself alone. The gospel tells the story of God's pursuing, faithful, wounded, angry, overruling, transforming, triumphant love. And it calls us to answer him with a love that cleanses our lives of all spiritual boredom. God's love is a pursuing, unconditional, covenantal, forgiving, price-paying love. And God calls us by his grace to respond to his initiating love with love and kind, a love that is faithful to him. Just as Hosea says to Gomer, from now on, no more other men. God says from, to you and me, from now on, no more idols. No more anything in your heart that you prefer more than you prefer me. No more competitors for first place in the affections of your heart. And that love to God is the only right response to his covenantal, unconditional, forgiving, price-paying, pursuing. And we could add 10 more adjectives or 100 more adjectives. Love for us. So what would God have us do? He would have us feel, feel, really feel the depth and height and width and breadth of his love for us in Christ Jesus. And he calls us to respond to him with love, with a loyal love as well. And God gives grace for the response that we need to have. He gives us the loyal love that we need to have for him. All right, we need to get to verses four and five. <clears throat> so we see these horrific days for the Jewish people who live in the Holy Land in these days. But Hamas is not the end of the story and Hezbollah is not the end of the story. Here's the end of the story, verses four through five. Okay? And these are based on the way that Hosea is going to live with Gomer. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince. Ever since the Babylonian captivity, there's only been a short period at the time of the Maccabees in the hundreds BC when there was a king, arguably, in the line of David uh, ruling over Israel. Otherwise, does Israel have a Davidic king today? Benjamin Netanyahu, I don't think, is a Davidic king, <laughs> as far as I know. Uh, no temple. The temple was rebuilt, was destroyed again, hasn't been rebuilt since AD 70, or almost 2,000 years without a temple. So they'll live for some period of time, message doesn't say how long, without effort, the, um, the garment by which they were able to discern the Lord's will, or household gods, God's God will cleanse them of their idolatry once for all times. 
But then verse five, afterward, when is afterward? Sometime in the future, right? This hasn't happened yet because we see at the end, it's going to happen in the latter days. Well, the latter days started with the resurrection of Jesus, okay? But it hasn't happened yet in the latter days, at least not in large numbers. Afterward, the children of Israel, and I take that to mean ethnically Jewish people, shall return and seek the Lord their God. And David their king, who's that? Who's David their king? Yeah, Jesus, who is the Davidic king in the line of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. As the angel said to Mary, he'll have the throne of his father David, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So they will return to the Lord. They will seek the Lord. They will seek their Messiah, David their king. They will bow to Jesus Christ as Lord. And they shall come in fear to the Lord. This is the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. They shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. So what is Hosea talking about in verse five? I think I would submit to you for your consideration. I think he's talking about the same event that the apostle Paul is talking about in Romans 11, verses 25 and 26, where he warns us as Gentiles, Gentile Christians, lest you be wise in your own conceits and think, well, we're better than the Jewish people because we're Christians and they're not. Lest you be wise in your own conceits. I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. I think Paul is looking for that in God's economy, in God's providence, the time of the Gentiles will be full, of the redemption of the Gentiles will be full, whatever that means. But in that day, all Israel will be saved which means at very least God will cause massive numbers of ethnic Jews to bow in submission and worship to their Messiah. The scales will fall from their eyes as the scales fell from Paul's eyes in Acts 9. God will cause the scales to drop and they will see the miracle of 2 Corinthians 4, 6, they will see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is the Savior, is the King, is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. And by God's grace, they will trust in him and be brought into the church, into the New Testament people of God, just as they were the Old Testament people of God, but only better. <laughs> because this time they will come all of them in faith, whereas in the Old Testament age, not all of them had saving faith. All of them will come in saving faith. Um, I think, I think that's the day that Hosea's looking forward to. And I think that's Hamath, again, Hamath and Hezbollah are not God's final word for Israel. We need to pray like the Dickens in the meantime, right? I mean, how exercised have you been in prayer this week um, for hostages, for hostages, for, you know, innocent uh, Palestinians as well who hate, there are many who hate Hamas. There are many uh, Christians, or not many, but there are at least some Christians among the Arabs in Gaza as well, who hate Hamas. Um, so we need to pray for them as well. But uh, we pray for Israel and for, uh, it's the peace of Jerusalem, right? And for that God would grant 
Israel's security and safety, but that God would grant that this day would hasten. This day would come soon when ethnic Jews would bow before Christ and submit to uh, David, their king, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, any final questions or comments? Again, before we take this, just remember, when you're on the way home, God's love, steadfast, covenantal, forgiving, pursuing love. Just let, allow yourself to, you know, sometimes I'm so bad. I'm just so bad. God, you know, I'm the one exception among Christians. I know God loves Kevin that way. I know he loves Rachel that way. I know, you know, he loves Willie that way for sure. But not me, not me. But that's not true. That's God's love. If you're a Christian, and it, it, there's much more to say that God does not overlook our sin. And let's be clear about that. But that's another passage for another day. Here, it's God's love. All right. That all of Israel would be redeemed. So when scripture talks about the remnant, how does that apply in? Okay, the, the remnant is um, ever since the, God made Israel his people at the time of the Exodus. As Paul says in Romans 9, not all Israel is Israel. There has always been a remnant among the Jewish people of those who truly have faith in the Lord. You remember the time of the private prophet Elijah. There are 500 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Okay, that was the remnant in the northern kingdom at that time. There's a remnant today of believing ethnically Jewish people. A small remnant, but there's a remnant. And the promise is one day that will become much more than a remnant. Much more, much, much more than just a remnant. Good question. Thank you. One I could actually answer. <laughs> you usually ask questions I can't answer. Mm -hmm. Or that's specific to Israel. The, uh, the idea of remnant, it's sort of the same, but it's different. The idea of remnant applies to Israel. Okay. Uh, when we talk about the church, we talk about, and Luther was the one who um, put his finger on this and used good talk. We talk about the visible and the invisible church. The visible church is all the people who are members of churches. The invisible church is uh, the, the community of those who, by God's grace, truly trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 31 says under the new covenant, everybody would be a believer. Okay, so the difference is starting to get complicated, but you see the difference I'm drawing? Okay, the, the invisible church that, you know, Paul, uh, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2 is known only to God, ultimately. Um, the invisible church, the, the real church, everybody's truly a believer. And that's the difference. Those are the only ones in covenant with the Lord. In the New Testament age. All right. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we do pray as we close um, that you would hasten the day when ethnically Jewish people who are would hear the gospel, and it would no longer fall on deaf ears, on ears like those of Isaiah's day, but it would fall on ears that you have opened, God, by your grace, and there would be a dramatic and wonderful and glorious work of your grace in the hearts of ethnically Jewish people, drawing them to faith in the one who is their Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, of the tribe of Judah, descended from King David, whose throne will have no end. Grant them, God, faith in their hearts and use even the horrific circumstances of the last week, God, and they are horrific and they are terrible. But use even those 
to cause Israelis to ponder, to ponder. Is this Jesus about whom these Christians talk? Is he, in fact, the Messiah? And Lord, uh, we cannot leave Hosea 3 without just basking in the greatness of your love for us. But seeing also that you call us to answer your love with a love that replies to it. And even as we see that command and think, God, it's impossible for me to love you back because I'm so sinful. You look at us in your grace and say, I'll give you the grace to love me back. You'll love because I first loved you. In John 17, 26, I planted my own love. Thank God that we would love you, that we would prefer you to everything else, that there would be no competitors for first place in our souls, but that we would very simply love the Lord our God with all our hearts and souls and minds and strength. Because God, you first loved us with the covenantal, pursuing, forgiving love, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.